about that. Okay. And we'll, we'll try elevate so Ms. Pat, you can hear us. We'll try to speak louder. All right, so Gordon, would you mind sharing with us where you and your family are from? Okay, lots of people always ask me, why South Africa? Well, my maternal grandfather is a Scot from Glasgow. Yeah, I'm using a microphone, it's bad. Anyhow, he was from Glasgow in Scotland and he served in the Highland Regiment in the Anglo Boer War, which was from 1899 to 1902. He served, got a Distinguished Service Medal, um, which my brother now has in his keeping. And he, he decided at the end of the war in 1902 that he really liked South Africa, so he returned with his family to a, a city called Bloemfontein, which is in the center of the country, about 600 miles northeast of, of Cape Town. And there he established a boarding house and um, in 1906, my mother was born, Doris, Doris Mitchell. His name is George Mitchell. On my paternal side, my grand, the, the Crags, in fact, we, we've got quite a good history of the Crags. They were from Lincolnshire in the northeast of, of, of the UK. And Lincolnshire is where Epworth is, where, where Samuel Wesley and then the Wesley family were. So I guess it's not surprising that eventually the Crags ended up as firm Methodists. Um, my dad was born in Manchester and he, uh, his, his father was Henry Lynn Crag. Um, his father then moved to Leeds to open a drapery shop. And my grandfather's brother, had moved to South Africa as a missionary. And the, the drapery shop wasn't doing too well in Leeds, so, so my grandfather's brother set up a position in a small town, Colesburg in South Africa, for my grandfather. So the family migrated out to Colesburg, which is about 500 miles northeast of Cape Town, just a small town, and that's where my father was brought up. I want to tell you a little bit about my father and his, his, his career. My grandfather was a real old-time Methodist and rather puritanical, actually, and my, my father and his siblings had a rather strict puritanical upbringing. Very few friends and not involved in sport and so forth. But he, um, he got a scholarship to what is now the University of Cape Town, in, in, in Cape Town. And he studied, he got a, a what would now be a BSc honours in physics and mathematics. So he, he, he got a lectureship there. This was about 1914. It was the First World War. He applied to join the, the um, British Army, but his, his eyesight was a real, real, um, really not good. So he did, he did fortunately for me, I think he, he, didn't, he wasn't recruited to the Army. But he, he remained very interested in Methodism even though he got his, his bachelor's degree in, 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 in the sciences and physics. And he became a candidate for the Methodist ministry in, in about 1918. And he actually served as a circuit rider, a horseback in the rural areas in South Africa for three years. Um, and he was also an avid reader and he, he read a lot of the British theologians and also a very interesting uh, Harry Ellison Fosdick's works. He became very impressed by those. And um, he, he, he sort of, he said that Fosdick's works made real to him the human life of Jesus. And also opened his eyes to the modern and reasonable view of the Old Testament. Um, the South African Methodism at that stage was fairly fundamentalist and, and conservative. Anyhow, he, he then, after three years as a, as a circuit rider, he decided to get a Bachelor of Divinity and he, he went to Richmond College near London, which is the oldest Wesleyan theological college, in fact, and he got his bachelor's degree in 1924, Bachelor of Divinity, and returned to South Africa to um, a small town near the border with 
Vasudu, which was called Vasudaland in those days. And very interestingly, he, he established strong relations, relationships with African churches, both in South Africa and in Lesotho. But he then moved to Bloemfontein, where my mother was born. And very interesting, he moved to a big church in Bloemfontein and stayed at the boarding house that my mother's father was running. So they met and uh, the rest is history concerning that. But um, they were married in 1929. During this period, my father was also reading extensively. And he, um, as he said in his, in his, his memoirs, his readings set him on the road to liberalism. Because South Africa was a segregated society even before the advent of apartheid. But this set him on the road to liberalism. He, having had his Bachelor of Divinity training in, in, in the UK, he then was offered a position teaching theological students at a, at a theological seminary in Cape Town. These were mainly white students. And he and my mother, after, after they were married, they went down to Cape Town. And he taught at this seminary till 1940. And the seminary was then closed because of World War II. A lot of, a lot of the younger people were going off to, to the war. But my dad um, moved to several small churches in the hinterland. And he expanded his, his connections with African congregations and really developed a very close relationship with many, many African preachers. Um, my brother, Donald, he was born in 1933 and I was born in 1936. I gather that I was called Gordon because the Gordon Highlanders were passing through Cape Town at that stage <laughs> on their way to, to Southeast Asia, I think, to uh, where, they, where there were problems. Um, my dad, with his, all his contacts with African congregations and so forth, was elected president of the South Af Southern African Methodist Con Conference, which actually covered not only South Africa, but neighboring countries like Mozambique, Botswana, and the Sudan, and Swaziland, and even up to a certain extent in Zimbabwe, although in Zimbabwe, the United Methodists were strong up there. So my dad had his presidential year in 1948, and that was the year that the apartheid regime, the apartheid government, was elected to power. And um, he uh, he was very vocal in his criticism of the apartheid, which was, in fact, there had been segregation, but apartheid enforced it by the law, enforced the separation of all the races. It, it was it, it, it was a an awful system where you had, of course, the best areas, major areas for whites, and then the Africans had, had the lesser areas, and in between the Indian population um, would, and the so-called mixed race, the colors, would have um, you know, areas of intermediate between the white and the African. Um, but in 1948, he was invited to go to the one of the first African universities, in fact, to be established in Africa, the University of Port Hare, in a small town called Alice, which was a little bit northeast of Cape Town. And there he became the senior tutor for candidates for the Methodist ministry, mainly African candidates, uh, as well as a few others, but not so not white as it were, sort of Africans and, and mixed race candidates. And he spent 12 years there teaching. This University College of Fort Hare had some very prominent students too. Um, Nelson Mandela studied at Fort Hare, got his degrees. Golden Becky, who was the father of the president after Nelson Mandela, Taro Becky studied there, and also Robert Mugabe got his degree at, at Fort Hare. And my dad regarded those 12 years from 1948 to 1960 
Fort Hill was run by the churches, by the way, Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist. But in 1960, it was taken over by the government, so my dad decided to leave at that stage, and it became a very much an apartheid run university. But he regarded those as the best years, best years of his, his career. And for me, they were very meaningful years because I got to meet many of the African students, both in the uh, candidates for the Methodist ministry, but also in the general student body. But when they went, when they, when my father went to Fort Hare in 1948, it was a small town. The schools weren't particularly good, so I went to a Methodist school in Grahamstown, which was a somewhat larger city about um, 60 miles from the small town of Alice, where Fort Hare was. And I went to this Methodist school, and at the age of 11, then I became a boarder. And it, it, I, I enjoyed four years there from 1952. I got very interested in sports, you know, cricket, tennis, um, cross-country running, and so forth. But to my great um, good fortune, I had a very good science teacher and really urged me to go into the sciences, in a way following my father's footsteps in his early days. So I went to Rhodes University in Grahamstown. Rhodes University was named after Cecil John Rhodes, of course, who's, who made his fortune in the mining, diamonds and gold, etc., in South Africa. And in fact, um, established the Rhodes Scholarships, which are probably the most prestigious of, of international scholarships. Now, I went to Rhodes University, did an honors degree in, in um, chemistry, and that I went there in 1953. And after I'd completed my honors degree, the prof there sort of uh, asked me to stay on as a junior lecturer. Teaching, teaching chemistry, me and several of my good friends who had also got the chemistry degrees. But in 1960, I and, and some of my friends said, hey, this is just cheap academic labor. You know, we, we've been corralled into, the, into this providing cheap, cheap lectureship. And we decided, let's get out of here. And I was very lucky to go to get into Oxford University, in fact. And I think one of the factors there was the fact that my brother, in 1953, had got a Rhodes Scholarship to, to Oxford, where he studied um, divinity and, mi and missionary history, South African missionary history. So I, I, I went to Oxford in 1960, and I did my, my doctorate in, in chemistry, and um, had a good time socially. I didn't, I didn't actually... I belonged to Christchurch College, which was one of the one of the major colleges, but I didn't actually live in college. We stayed in Diggs. I, I shared a flat, flat as an apartment with with a with a New Zealand friend who we still keep in contact with. Went to the, he went to the University of Auckland, a professor of physics. But at the end of my completing my my doctorate there, um, during this period, I drifted away from the church. In fact. As so many people go to college, do actually drifted away, stopped going to church. But Oxford, of course, was the start of Methodism, because John and Charles Wesley studied at Oxford, and there, there's a wonderful, a large church in Oxford, the Wesley Memorial Church, um, which uh, I never attended, and I really regret it now. I, I could have had tremendous, tremendous benefit from attending. Uh, that church. Anyhow, I didn't. But at the end of the doctor of studies, um, the general pattern then was for, for folk who had done PhDs in the sciences to want to go to the States to do postdocs. And I, I chatted to my, my main supervisor, um, Professor Sir Hewitt Jones, another Jones, and he said, well, hey, Gordon, you know, you've been in this cold and dreary climate of Oxford for, for three years. Let's, let's find somewhere sunny for you in the States. <laughs> and he suggested several places, but we eventually decided on UCLA, of course. And before I went to UCLA, I went back to South Africa just to, to see my parents. And that and my mother said to me, 
Now, young man, don't you go meeting a nice young American girl. Um, but I moved on to UCLA. I remember flying into LA and seeing this massive, uh, oh, massive lights below me and thinking to myself, what the heck am I going to do? Where am I going to stay? But UCLA had a very good foreign student organization. And when I emerged from the plane, here was a nice young lady sort of with a, with a welcome sign sent me to the home of a professor to stay for three days, and then I found an apartment, which I shared with another postdoctoral person in our group, uh, also from the UK. Now, I said that UCLA had a very good foreign student organization. They had lots of social functions. And my, my, my roommate, my apartment mate, uh, Dick Wheeler, and I decided, well, there was a nice social function going on organized by the foreign student organization, so we went along to this function and um, as soon as we got there, we got in touch with two rather attractive young ladies who were at this function. And as you can imagine, as you'd expect, one of them was Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> and we decided to have lunches together. And Dick and the, the young lady, he met up with eventually parted ways, but Jackie and I stayed having lunches together. Um, remember on November the 22nd, 1963, sharing lunch. That was the day President Kennedy was assassinated and the, the university was closed down. We had lunch there and it, it, it was not a, not a happy time. But, um, so my days, uh, Jack and I went out a lot together and before I returned to South Africa, we, we got engaged in December 1963. I think it was. Yes, that's right. Got to remember these dates. Um, but I had to go back to South Africa to fulfill some obligations to, to a, an institution which had sponsored by some of my postdoctoral work at UCLA. Jackie had to finish her BA at UCLA, so we were apart for, for two years, in fact. Um, and of course, those weren't the days of email and uh, you know, Skype and all that. It was a man, we, I think we had one phone call during those two years and it was some sort of radio telephone which voices echoed back and forth. And, uh, um, but I, re I returned end of 1966, we were married in, in North Hollywood and uh, returned to South Africa via Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, a terrific honeymoon in fact. We were in Pretoria for about five or six years. I joined the faculty of the, Uni of the University of South Africa in the chemistry department. And after those, after, after about six years, I got sabbatical leave. So wanted to get back to the States and I, I applied at several places, but we eventually ended up at Arizona State University where I joined a group of, of, of a professor, uh, Bob Pettit, who was studying natural sources of drugs. And this is where I got my introduction to what really was my passion in life, isolating new drugs from nature, from plants, from marine organisms, from bacteria, from fungi, and so forth. So I had a good sabbatical year there, and and then returned to South Africa to the University of Cape Town, which of course Cape Town is a beautiful place. I'm just so glad to go from Pretoria to Cape Town. And we spent the next um, six years at the University of Cape Town. I was on the faculty of the chemistry department. Jackie, in fact, joined the, the University of Cape Town Library. Um, but during that period, well, I contacted at Arizona State University, Bob Perrett, uh, established what he called his Cancer Research Institute. And he sent me a, a letter and said, hey, why don't you come back and join us in, you know, in a permanent way? And at first, we were rather reluctant to leave, leave the beauties of Cape Town and the close proximity to wonderful wine farms and so forth. But eventually we decided, let's, let's return to the States particularly to get closer to Jackie's parents. So in, in 1979, we returned to the States, to Arizona State University. 
and um, spent the next five years at ASU working on, I was working on isolation of nucleotides from, from natural sources and found some interesting, interesting potential drugs. But I was very fortunate. Bob Pettit had grants from the National Cancer Institute for this work. So he used to have visits from people from NCI coming along to see how, how the research was progressing. And I met a young, young fellow, Matt Suthness, who was the, um, the NCI representative who visited Pettit for me. And we became pretty close friends. And a position, a temporary position came up at the Nat Natural Products Branch at the National Cancer Institute in about, oh, 19, in, towards the end of 1984. And Matt contacted me and said, hey, why don't you, why don't you consider coming there? It was a temporary position and neither Jackie nor I particularly enjoy it living in the, in the Phoenix area. So I took the plunge and, and took this temporary position at the National Cancer Institute. And fortunately, after a year, it, it was rolled over into a permanent position. And that, that was a transforming moment for my career, in fact, because I, um, in 1989, I became chief of the, the NCI Natural Products Branch. And we established a um, program, expanded program, looking for new anti-cancer drugs from natural sources plants, marine organisms, and so forth. And we, we actually established collection programs with good botanical gardens, Missouri Botanical Garden, New York Botanical Garden, collections of plants and collections of marine organisms in over 35 countries worldwide. Mainly, mainly what we'd call um, less developed countries, developing countries, because that's where all the rich biodiversity is located. So, um, but of course, these countries would say, okay, well, it's all very well. Here's, here's the wealthy National Cancer Institute coming and collecting all our nat natural resources, plants, and so forth. What's in it for us, apart from a potentially expensive cancer drug coming out, which they couldn't afford? So, we established collaborative agreements with these countries. Um, and, and this, I, I played quite a big role. I visited Oh, over 38 countries, in fact, establishing collaborative agreements. And it, through these agreements, we guaranteed benefit sharing should a great new drug be discovered. And also, in the meantime, we, we sponsored their scientists to visit the National Cancer Institute and get training, technology transfer, and so forth. So this, this was a wonderful, for 20 years I did this, as I say, I, I visited 38 countries, gave over 160 lectures in these, in these countries and established very good relationships with scientists in all these countries. Good collaborative relationships. And these scientists were from a lot of different backgrounds, of course, different cultures, African, Asian, um, Latin America, and also different religions. So I, I got to work with folk of very interesting backgrounds. And this made a tremendous impression on me and um, has been a lasting impression. I retired in the end of 2004. I'm still a so-called National Institute of Health volunteer. So I, I still get involved a bit in NIH work. But um, I think when I look back on my life, moving to the University of Fort Hare with my father and establishing over, over about 12 years, establishing really nice friendships with many of the students at Fort Hare. And then also in my period in serving at the National Cancer Institute, traveling to so many different countries where there were so many different cultures and, and religions, establishing good relationships with those really molded my, my, my sort of attitude to, particularly to collaboration, fair and equitable collaboration with scientists and government administrators and so forth worldwide. So that was my, more or less my career.
to many folks going to college in fact you, you you tend to sort of drift off a little bit and I mean I mean I've been a regular church tender during my my younger days and of course at a, at a Methodist school um, but you know other social activities sort of uh, came into priority and I just I just just dropped off and I said I, I, I regretted particularly at Oxford not going to the great uh, Wesley Memorial Church and, and, and we were sharing in their worship. Um, I think my, as, as far as my faith journey is concerned, um, when we, when Jack and I were in Cape Town, we, we attended church sporadically over there. But when we came back to ASU, we, we linked up with the Methodist Church in Tempe, Arizona. But then coming to the National Cancer Institute in, in oh, 1985, we settled in Bethesda, and we started looking around for, for churches. And the one church that really appealed to us, when we came to it, was North Bethesda. Mary, some of you might remember Mary Alice Edwards, and how she, she greeted us and uh, welcomed us to the to the service and told us a great amount and we got involved in Sunday school classes and so forth. And I think that, that was the period really when when my my faith and interest in in um, religion as it were was restored. So there was quite a long, long period when I when I had sort of strayed from the pole, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Well I know I speak for everyone who's here with Rachel for I know I enjoy classical music, go to symphony concerts and so forth, and I'm, uh, in, in my younger days I certainly enjoyed sport, tennis, and, um, and certainly running, but um, nowadays I've got to the stage where going to the Asbury gym is, is, is enough exercise for me and some, and some good walking too. Um, walk, uh, certainly interested in travel. Jack and I do a lot of travel nowadays, as some of you might realize. And it, it's wonderful to go to these countries and, and go to hike around. Really enjoy walking. Um, Sitsi and, and Chen might appreciate this. I mean, last year we were in South Island, New Zealand. Had a tremendous, tremendous hike up to Mount Cook. You probably were there too. So, um, but you know, my passion in life has become nature. Nature, it's, and I've been very fortunate to, to be able to include this passion both in my career, looking for new drugs from nature, and in traveling to so many fascinating countries and, and, and meeting. And through, through these um, 
studies, drug discovery, and so forth, meeting so many interesting people from so many different cultures and so forth. So this this is really this is really um, been my passion. Nature as a source a source of wonder drugs, and then also just the sheer beauty of of God's creation. And we just got to hope and pray. We live on a wonderful planet, but let's just hope and pray that it it'll be preserved for future generations. Also, one of my through through my um, work at mainly at NCI, I'm a firm believer in collaboration. In the, in the drug discovery area, no one person, no one group can do it by themselves. Collaboration, particularly on the international level, is absolutely essential. So um, I am a firm believer in collaboration in all walks of life, whether it be science or, or in society or in, in, in religion, in fact. Um, my brother um, has been a member of Church Unity Commissions in South Africa and worldwide, in fact, and collaboration with the different churches I think is important, and collaboration within our own church family. Now, I might just add here that um, North Bethesda United Methodist Church has just been a, a fantastic, uh, a wonderful experience for both Jackie and myself, and we just love the diversity in so many respects, whether it be um, racial, cultural, or sexual orientation and so forth. I, I, it's, I, we, we just love the diversity and we love the commitment of our church family to serving on missions projects, serving the less fortunate, both in our, in our area with feeding shelters, of course, and the rubbish sale, and then, of course, worldwide supporting, supporting um, uh, poor, poor sort of people worldwide. Thank you, Gordon. So, um, yes, you've mentioned the importance of collaboration, and especially in your work, um, and recognizing that you were working in countries that were seen as more developing, mm -hmm. and um, I thought it was, you know, interesting and, and true that you said, you know, we would go in these countries and they would say, well, we're going to help you and collaborate with you, but then we're not going to be able to afford the drugs you need. You set up a whole system where that could be done. Um, so you're from South Africa. You saw the beginning of my type. Your father saw it. You lived through it. Um, and then you're also, um, your career has been spent um, with that background, kind of collaborating and making sure that there are equitable practices in your in your work. Would you please share with us more about your experiences around equity and about around race? Well, as I said, my, my father had a tremendous influence on me, and I, I just like to um, sort of read one of the one of his quotes about his his belief in, in racial equity and, and, and racial and justice. He, to quote him, is, I believe in what is miscalled the social gospel. That is, that Christianity must find expression in social and political life as well as in piety and spirituality. And I believe that in South Africa today, a test of a man's, and we could expand that to personal really, of a man's genuine Christianity is his attitude to race. And a Christian church which will not stand for and work for racial justice and a Christian order of society, as well as individual salvation, is failing in its mission. And I strongly, I strongly believe in that. Um, also, my, my brother's involvement in church unity, I, I've, I've learned a lot from that. And my niece, Carol, uh, Donald's daughter, who got a, a, an MD from the University of Cape Town, in fact, is probably the most liberal of all of us. She, she became a member of the African National Congress during the apartheid days. And for a 
young white lady to become a member of the African National Congress with the apartheid government looking at every move you know, she made. I think that was a, a, an incredible commitment to, to racial justice. And in fact, she, she took part in protests while she was at the University of Cape Town and, and had several rough encounters with the police and so forth. But uh, she, she, she has certainly been an inspiration to me. And another, another major influence on, um, on my, my attitude to race was the peaceful transition of South Africa from apartheid to what they call the, the rainbow nation. Uh, to me, it's, it's just miraculous. And it depended on having leaders like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, who, who were, to my mind, Nelson Mandela was 27 years in jail. And he came out of jail and forgave all the people who had been oppressing him. He, he was totally reconciled to working with everyone. And this, this, this is a sort of a, a model for me to collaborate on every level, to work with everyone. No problem is too great to solve in a peaceful and equitable manner, I think. And Nelson Mandela, I think, has a certain example for the world which, which, um, which few have, have really been able to follow in the, in the political sphere. So these, 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 these have had, uh, had a tremendous impact on my attitude and, and I'm so, so um, grateful, so um, oh, it, it's a wonderful experience to be in this church where we have so many different races and so forth and, and for those who get along and advance the, the mission of making disciples for Jesus Christ. Um, Gordon, I wonder if you could um, let us know about the science, the different sciences you work with. Did you experience, uh, did you see any instances of racism with the sciences from the um, developing countries, or just what is what was that like? No, I um, no, I didn't. I didn't experience much in the way of racism. We we invited many. Scientists from oh, from many African countries, South Latin America, from from Asian countries to come and work in the NCI labs, and um, they got on fine. They, they, it, everything seemed to work very smoothly, actually. And I think um, I think my having been brought up in South Africa, in fact, and having had developed friendships with with so many African students and so forth, in a way helped me um, provide some guidance there too. Um, but all, all the colleagues uh, I've met in all these many different countries have just, just been phenomenal. I mean, um, countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, which of course are, are Muslim, and, um, in the, and, and such different cultures, and then we were very close. I have, I have a lot of good friends and, and colleagues down in Brazil, for instance. It's, um, I, 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 I think I've just been so blessed in the opportunities that have come up for me, and particularly my, my being able to develop close collaboration with so many wonderful people, not only scientists, but work with government administrators in many different countries too. Thank you. Uh, so finally, what have you had to learn or unlearn around issues of social justice? Well, I think I think um, I know Rose in her presentation talked about a journey, and um, I think the the reconciling process of North Bethesda United Methodist Church has been a journey for me, in fact, and and I've been so. Um, Grateful for the for the, the folk in our in our church family who have borne witness to the 
in the trials they have gone through because of um, their sexual orientation, as it were, of the trials and the discrimination and the bigotry they have had to face. And, and I, I've learned so much from them. And I've also learned a lot from folk who's, who, who they, when they found out that members of their family are, are of a, of a, a different sexual orientation and so forth. For me, I, I really, I remember when the young people organized these, these um, oh, panels, panel discussions, when we were on our, our path to final reconciliation. And I praise the young people for that work and their mentors, by the way. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, it was wonderful to hear the, the, the witness uh, and the testimony of, of some of our people who have been through that process. Um, thank you very much. Um, I might add, too, now that I'm, I'm, I'm really disturbed by um, what's happening, you know, in terms of, um, uh, oh, certain aspects of discrimination, which not only in this country, but in, in, in many other countries, uh, that there is, there is, there is a certain uh, return to, to this. But I'm, I'm sure that things are going to eventually work out and that, that all, all will be good and good. But I'm, the, the sessions we've had with our storytelling and perspectives have been very informative to me and uh, I've learned a lot from your presentations, let's see, and, and from the presentations of others who aren't, you know, of my particular skin color, as it were, who have had to face and fear you know, discrimination and, um, you know, bigotry that might arise. I, I, I really, it's brought a new understanding to me and I hope that in the next, in the near future we can work our way through this again. Thank you, Gordon, so much. Um, can we all just give Gordon a hand? This was wonderful. And I also want to thank Gordon for his Bible study. For those of you who haven't attended, um, Gordon focuses on um, current issues, and he also sends the faith link topics out. Is it on the flash that you send it for? Oh, yeah. It's not. It's, it, 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 it's, it's actually to the Sunday school class, but I, you know, I, I thought about actually putting it out in a flash because that there might be folk who are not in our class who some of these articles might appeal. Right, um, a fantastic article. So I think if, if Gordon will let, open it up and put on flash, um, because those are those are also great articles, especially in our current climate. So we're going to take a few questions. We will maybe, if you have a question, ask you to say your question, and then we'll repeat it through the mic, and then Gordon you can answer. Paul, Gordon, I have many, many questions. I'm sure everybody does fascinating career, but one thing that struck me as you were, you were talking about the history of South Africa that surprised me, um, if I understood you, was that uh, apartheid developed relatively late. As I understood you, I would guess in context, you were saying the 1940s, I would guess actually the 1930s. That being so, why? Why did apartheid develop so late in the history of South Africa? So the question is, why did apartheid develop so late in the history of South Africa? Well, um, you know, as, as my father observed, there had been segregation in South Africa during the, oh, since the arrival of white, white settlers. There had been... Um, the, the first settlers, the first white settlers, the, the um, Dutch settlers, in fact, arrived in 1652 in, at the Cape of Good Hope, or what Sir Francis Drake called it, the Cape of Storms, because two oceans of it can be pretty rough around there. But, um, and I 
don't think there was segregation from that time, in fact. And when the, the first big wave of, of British uh, immigrants arrived in, in, in the um, 1820, um, there were wars fought between the, the, the ruling, ruling establishment, which was white, and the, the African tribes. Up, up, up in the in the northeast, the, in particular the Nkosi tribe and the and the Zulus. So there there, there was always this um, uh, segregation. But what apartheid did in 1948 was actually put it into law and made it illegal for Africans to live in a particular area. And of course, the whites had all the best areas and the best beaches around Cape Town and all that sort of stuff. And sorry, we have a few more minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyhow, so so apartheid put it was was actually legalizing the whole principle of segregation, and um, and it was uh, the, the fact that it was went into a peaceful transition in the 90s. I think to me was a miracle. I, I expected there might be some real bloodshed there. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, So any differences between the African church and the um, European church, the Methodist, the Methodist church? Um, well, my mother was very, very involved in, in what in, in, in the white church was called the women's auxiliary or the you know, women's group and that. Um, but the it, it wasn't particularly well organized. It was more a social gathering. Than that. But the, not that I know a lot about the women's men, yeah, I know, in, but uh, it, it was just wonderful. I used to travel around with my dad sometimes to when he was preaching in, in, in many African churches. And to see the women's manana in their red blouses and black skirts and so forth, and then I think white collars with it, uh, and, and the hats, yeah. They, they, they were such a, a tremendous, inspiring presence. In fact, when, um, when Jackie and I were back in Cape Town this, this past April, we went to uh, a church close to the University of Cape Town, which oh, in, in the old days was, was, you know, white. But to go to that church now, and the, the, it, it was just a mass of young African people but the African Manyana was there, I think, and they, they, they were leading the service. So it, it, the Manyana were more active, I think, in actually participating in leading services, whereas the, in the white church, it, it would be essentially the pastor and, and the, the women's auxiliary, you know, at the bars and things like that. Thank you for having me. We have time for one, one more question. Anyone has another question for Gordon? I'll ask one, maybe. Like I say, I could take up questions all, all day, but you say your love is in nature, yes. and you spent your better part of your career trying to find medicines for nature. Yes. So where does that stand? I mean, still optimistic about the possibilities? Uh, so, sorry. Um, the question for Paul was, which I also wanted to know, where does um, finding medicines from nature stand? Right now, at the moment. Well, I've just been to a meeting where this was discussed you know, in, in, in Lexington, Kentucky, and it's amazing. Uh, if you take the area of cancer, over sixty percent of the prescription drugs—these aren't herbal products, you know, like these, these are genuine prescription drugs—have their source in one way or another from nature. It might not be the actual chemical you isolate from the plant. But the, the chemical you isolate from the plant or the marine organism or the bacterium provides the scaffold for 
medicinal, what we call medicinal chemists to modify which, and improve their, their properties as a drug and eventually become uh, commercial drugs. And this, this is, um, but now, what's, what's become amazing is that, uh, you know, microorganisms, our body is made up of, joy, it might, must be trillions of microorganisms, um, but in, in one gram of soil, just, just a little teaspoonful of soil, it could be 10,000 different little microorganisms. And these are all little chemical factories. But what's happened, uh, and particularly what I was hearing in the um, talks at this past conference, was that they, they found out how nature actually makes these drugs, so-called biosynthesis, the various steps. And they actually are isolating or determining the genomes of microbes. Now you can do it in a couple of hours. And in the genome of a microbe, you might have clusters of genes which are responsible for the biosynthesis of these different drugs. And you are now, when you analyze the genomes of these microbes, they're finding that in a genome, there might be 50 or 60 different potential drugs, which we were never aware of before, before we did this, before genomics came on the story. So I think the, the potential now is enormous. And it's, it's very, it's, it's very, quite amusing actually. There, um, some, some of my colleagues are involved in, in the genomic studies and they, they've got websites um, like sendmeyourdirt.org. <laughs> so people can, and, and they're getting samples of soil now from all over the United States and Australia and that, and they, they're analyzing the, the, the bacteria and so forth in these, in these soil samples. And they're coming up with all sorts of potential novel chemicals with very interesting biological activity. And I, I, I feel very encouraged. I think I think we're on the. They say this century is going to be the biomedical. Is the biomedical century? Well, Gordon, you need to go out of retirement. Go back and do research. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I just. I don't pretend to understand the technical details nowadays. I just go to these meetings and get very excited about <laughs> what's being said. And um, the colleague and I uh, periodically review the new drugs from nature. And in the in the in the um, antibiotic area, seventy to eighty percent of the drugs are from nature. In fact, you know the penicillins. The original wonder drugs, in fact, came from a, a fungus. But now, penicillin and fungus. So, but but now with genomics, the the scope of discovery has been broadened tremendously, and um, yeah, I find it very exciting. Thank you, Gordon. Can we give Gordon a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. I don't know the, the, the sort of um, 
Okay. 